we are doing a series on foundations. It's the, the foundational beliefs we have as followers of Jesus. And each week we're trying to just state out loud the beliefs that we have. Because in a world that's just constantly changing around us, it's nice to know that there's something solid that we can base our lives on. And so in the sermon uh, notes this morning, on the back side of those, uh, inside your bulletin should be a little uh, leaflet like this. Uh, on the back of it is, is the Apostles' Creed. And we're going to say that out loud and just say it together uh, because they're just something that's powerful. When we say something, it becomes more and more real to us. And so if you just would say this along with me. I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. When we're doing this series on foundations, we're talking about the fundamental beliefs, and, and one of those is a belief in eternity, that we are here temporarily in these bodies, but this isn't where it stops. When we die, there's something lost afterwards. The issue that I have is, most of the stuff that is out there about eternity, about what heaven is like or what hell is like, most of those things are just, they're not true. They're not from the Bible. Uh, kind of like if you've seen this commercial. It says here you ran over a squirrel when you were 16. Oh, you saw that, huh? No, I was guessing. Huh. You never put the toilet seat down. What? You ripped the tag off your mattress. What? Does your bachelor party ring a bell? <laughs> Not going anywhere for an eternity? I'm not even going to look at puberty. Hey! Does this line ever move? Moving now, isn't it? <laughs> when you're really hungry, grab the big one. Next, you're a winner. All right, so brutal. Um, but <laughs> there are just so many things in there. That's our picture of heaven. Okay, that when you die, you've got to stand in this huge long line. Uh, St. Peter, which I don't know if they could have found a grumpier St. Peter than that, um, but he's got to figure out if you're going to go to heaven or hell. And it's, it's based on your deeds, whether or not you get in. Let's look at what the Bible says about heaven. So if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 25. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one of the chairs in front of you. It's page 702. Uh, you can look it up on your phone or tablet, or, or if you have your own Bible, Matthew's kind of toward the end, uh, after the book of Malachi, right before the book of Mark. Matthew 25, and Jesus is talking here, and as he's talking, he's telling us that heaven is a reality. It is a real place. And I'll start reading with verse uh, 31 in Matthew 25. Jesus says, When the Son of Man, that's Jesus, another name for him, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And so Jesus is talking, he's, he's giving us a picture of of what heaven is going to be, that, that it's going to be a real place that we go to. You know, if you're a follower of Christ, if you've made that decision to follow Jesus, but, but it never shows up in your actions, you never actually love people and, and live out your faith, do you have a real faith there? You know, when we're talking about heaven, uh, it, it, Jesus says it's a real place, but the Bible doesn't give us a lot of descriptions about what it's like. And today in, in our society, there, there are people that have said that they've had visions of heaven. 
They've had a near-death experience, and, and in that near-death experience, they say that they saw heaven in some way. Uh, Colton Burpo was a young kid who said that, that he almost died, and they said he saw heaven. There's a movie called Heaven is for Real that kind of tells his story. Uh, but there are other people. Uh, there's a kid named Alex Malarkey. Uh, there was a book named after his story, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. And he said that uh, when he was in a coma for uh, several months, that he experienced heaven. But just recently, in the last couple of weeks, he's taken his story back. He's recanted and said, you know what? I didn't really see those things. You know, I don't know when people say that they experienced those things. I don't know if what they saw is real or not. You know, I can't judge that because the Bible doesn't talk about near-death experiences. It's just not in there. There are some people that absolutely saw heaven. God opened up their vision. They, they got to see a vision of heaven. You know, Paul, Isaiah, John, uh, or a few people. But it was an experience caused by God. And so on a near-death experience, I, I don't know. The Bible's kind of really silent about that. And like I said, the, the Bible gives us some information about heaven. We know that heaven is, is going to be a place of enjoyment. It's called paradise. You know, it's a place of joy and pleasure and activities, uh, eating and drinking. Those things are mentioned as, as great things. Think of all the best things on the earth, and, and those things are going to be in heaven in some way. You know, the, the Bible doesn't say anything about sex in heaven, but the scholars really believe that there's something that would replace that in some way. Um, the Bible says that we are still going to be active. You know, our picture most of the time in heaven is, is sitting up on a cloud and playing a harp. And I'll tell you what, that's not going to be heaven if I'm there, okay? Because if I get stuck on a cloud playing a harp, it's not going to be bad just for me. It's going to be bad for you too because you've got to listen to it, all right? So it's, it's a place where we're also still going to be active and there's going to be work. Only the difference is our work is going to be redeemed. It's going to be productive, you know, when Adam and Eve fell, when, when they sinned, uh, part of the curse was that work became unproductive. You've probably experienced something like that. You go to work, you're there all day long, and at the end of the day, someone says, hey, so what'd you do today? Don't know. <laughs> it just seems like everything that I did, it, it just fell apart at the end. It's, it's like I didn't even show up. And you know how frustrating that can be. Well, in heaven, work is not like that. Work is something that is productive. It is something that you are able to see the good stuff that comes, and it doesn't come unraveled. Heaven is a place with people. Revelation tells us that every, people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation will be there. So there's going to be a lot of people in heaven. Um, just need to clear up something real quick. When you die, you don't become an angel. Okay? I know that there is a, a thought out there that, that when you, you become an angel, that's, that's not it. You're a human now, you'll be a human then. You have a resurrection body, and over the last couple of weeks, I've kind of talked about that resurrection body, so I'm not going to go into great detail. It's just, it's a, it's a super body. It's a, an X-Men body, all right? And so it's, it's, it's cool that way, um, but you're not an angel. You know, angels are a different type of creation. And so when we die, we are going to uh, be with people in heaven. And we're going to see our loved ones that have gone on before us. Uh, the Bible says we'll be able to recognize people that are there. Peter, James, and John were up on a mountain with Jesus, and he was transformed, and they saw his glory. And also there were Moses and Elijah. And Peter, James, and John had never met Moses and Elijah because they had lived hundreds and hundreds of years before, but they were able to recognize them right here. And so we'll be able to recognize people um, Heaven is also a place. Heaven is a place of no. It's a place of no. There's no sorrow. There's no death. There's no pain or stress or crying. In heaven, there's no darkness. There's no danger. There's no fear. There's no hunger. There's no thirst. Heaven is a place of no. The, the terrible things that are on this earth aren't going to be in heaven. And so we have that to look forward to. And I'll tell you what, that's incredibly comforting to me. Uh, I was a part of a, a funeral service here yesterday, and uh, Stacy DeBusman, uh, it was her memorial service. And there were different things that were said. You know, she uh, became a follower of Christ, and we know that she was active in this church and then in another one. But I heard a lot of Stacy's story yesterday, and from very, very early on in her life, it was hard. She lived a really hard life, not just growing up, but even as an adult. And even as an adult, there were, there were longings that she had had, and there were things that she wanted to have happen in her life that never did. 
She had Christ as her Savior, and she had a relationship with him, absolutely. There were things that she wanted to do on this earth and that she wanted to have happen on this earth. Some of those things never happened. But in heaven, we get to be God with God. We, all those longings, those desires, the, the, all those things, those things are filled. And that's one of the great hopes that we have about heaven is that all the things that we miss out on here on this earth, God has created a perfect place for us in heaven. And that's the hope that we hold on to. Beyond that, heaven is a place that we go to immediately. Now, for those of you that maybe grew up in the Catholic Church, um, the Catholic Church talks about purgatory. It's a place where that if you die and you're not really good enough to make it all the way to heaven, <clears throat> we know who we are. Um, if you're not good enough to make it all the way, there's a, there's a holding tank and you just kind of stay there. And it's a time that, that those that have done a whole bunch of sins... All right, it's a place you get cleaned up. And so uh, those of you that, that are still here on this earth, you can help those people out if you just uh, do some extra prayers, some extra giving. We can get them to heaven a little sooner, okay? And that's what the Catholic Church teaches. The problem with that is, is you read through the Bible, Jesus died for all of our sins to pay all of the penalty for all the sins. So all those things are covered. And, and Romans says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote and said, to be absent with the body is to be present with Christ. If you're a follower of Christ and you die, okay, you don't have to go to some holding tank somewhere, okay? You go straight to the presence of Christ. That is a great thing. Uh, if we had to hang out in a place and, and get cleansed from all of our sins there, yeah, that doesn't sound real good to me. But heaven is a place, it's a place with God. And we get to dwell with God forever. We get to dwell with our Heavenly Father who, who knows us, and He loves us despite everything that He knows about us. He wants to be with us forever. You know, we have this desire to be known. We have a desire to be loved. And in heaven, we're with a perfect Heavenly Father. And we have that to look forward to as well. But we need to make sure that we understand this. Heaven, uh, heaven is not this place up in the clouds where you just go and hang out. All right, heaven is actually on this earth. In Second Peter chapter three, uh, it says this: the day of the Lord, when Jesus returns, will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. What that's saying is, God is going to redo this creation. Remember how, how God created the earth, and then he flooded the earth and started over? Same thing's going to happen. God is, has the earth here. He's going to redo it with fire, and it's going to be a new, better earth. And instead of us living up in the clouds somewhere, we're living here on earth with God. And that's part of the reason I think we have these, these new bodies, these new resurrection bodies, is because um, we're going to be on this new earth, and things are going to be different. And the Bible's not real clear how all those differences work out, but I think that, that we are going to have things to do. I mean, we have a whole universe to explore. So that's probably one of the reasons why we need an eternity, because we've got a huge place to look at it, and we need a long time to look at it all. And we're going to have responsibilities and work and things to do there. As you read through the Bible, you see absolutely heaven is a reality. The Bible talks about it all the time. But also in this passage, we see that's not all. We also see that hell is a reality. There in chapter 25, verse 41, Jesus goes on and says this, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they, they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. 
See, Jesus says hell is a real place. And in the New Testament, it talks about hell uh, 12 different times. The, the word Gehenna is used for hell. 11 of the times, Jesus is the one that is talking about it. Gehenna is, is kind of an illustration that's used uh, about the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom is just right there outside of Jerusalem, and it was a dump. So uh, the, the trash for the whole city of Jerusalem would kind of go out there, and it stunk. And so they would set it on fire, and it would burn up all that stuff. And, and so all this trash was being heaped there, and it would be smoldering uh, as it had leftover, you know, fire going on. So just a, a really awful, disgusting place. And Jesus used that as an illustration of how bad hell was going to be, you know, even more so. There are descriptions in the Bible of hell of, of being a place of fire, a place of darkness, a place of torment and suffering. A place of separation from God and from other people. You know, there, there are times we probably all have no people like this. They say, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to heaven. I'm going to be partying hell with all my friends. You know, we probably know people like that. And the problem with that is you're not going to party with your friends in hell because part of hell is separation, being alone, separate from everyone else. But then people ask, if, if hell is such a terrible place, well, then how could a loving God send people there? Well, understand, first of all, hell was not designed for people. See what it said there in verse 41, what Jesus said? He will say to those, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Heaven was set up as a place of punishment for the devil and his demons. That's what it's designed for. But... It, uh, what that also means is the devil's not in charge of hell. Okay, all the cartoons that we see with the devil and his pitchfork and the, and the pointy tail and all that stuff, and he's telling people where to go, yeah, that's not what it is. He, he's cast into hell. But God doesn't send people to hell. People choose to go to hell when they choose to reject God. That sounds kind of weird, but at the same time, think about it. There are people on this planet that don't want anything to do with God. I mean, honestly, that's what it is. I don't want anything to do with God. Well, if you don't want anything to do with God now, why would you want to be with him forever? That just doesn't make sense. And God says, you know what? I'm not going to force myself. I will make myself available. Every, every person on this planet knows that there is a God in some way or another. Now, some people may deny him or whatever, but God has made himself known to everyone, and people know that there's a God and say, you know what? I want to do my own thing. And so God says, okay, well, you can do your own thing. And that's the choice that people make. But still, I know God's letting us make the choice, but it just still sounds harsh because God, God's a God of love. And, and since he loves us, he, just, he has to love us no matter what. And it's true that God is a God of love, but God is also a God of justice. In 2 Thessalonians, it says God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. You know, that's, that's an awful thing. That's an awful thing. We like justice. When we see someone on TV that goes out and kills people and then like he gets killed, we kind of cheer inside. Because we're like, yeah, he deserved that. He got justice. He, that's what he deserves for, for doing that stuff to those people. And we really like justice for other people. Because when it comes to us, we want mercy and we want grace. And whenever we do something wrong, we're really good at saying, you know, well, I, yeah, I may have done that wrong, but honestly, here's the reasons why I don't deserve justice. You know, it's, it's it, I, uh, man, it, it was just a bad circumstances, and that's why I chose this. And, and you know, it really wasn't my fault. And, and we really seek justice for other people, and we seek grace and mercy for ourselves. But God says he's the God of justice, and, and we need to start to see our sins the things that we do do wrong, we need to see those as acts against a holy and righteous God. And God says that there's justice. 
And there's punishment. When we break God's law, then there's a punishment that goes with that. And until we really see our sins as against the holy God, it's hard for us to see that God is a God of justice. We're going to, it's hard for us to see that, that we need him. But as you read through the Bible, you're going to see two things. Number one, heaven is a reality. It's a place for those who love God and want to spend forever with him on earth. They want to spend forever with him in heaven. And hell is a reality. God didn't design it for people, but people choose to go there when they reject him. And if you're rejecting God here on this earth, why do you want to spend forever with him? But how do we get to heaven? You know, there's a lot of confusion about that as well, and there's a lot of people that, that struggle with that. And people don't know exactly what gets us to heaven. And, and here's an interview with some people about how they think that we get to heaven. Here's the million dollar question. If there is a heaven, how do you get there? Yeah. yeah. So how, how would you get to heaven? It's a good question. It's a good question? Yeah. If you die, you don't want to go to heaven, right? Right. So what do you think you got to do to get there? Uh, not much, man. Just kind of chill, hang out, party, and you'll end up there. God accepts everybody who they are. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. So you're going to go to heaven when you die, huh? Yeah. How do you get there? Smoke. Smoke? So if all I gotta do to go to heaven is smoke. That's horrible, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you were to die tonight and you stand before God, you think He'd let you into heaven? Yeah, I think He would. Why is that? Absolutely. I mean, I mean because everybody, I, go ahead, everybody are sinners, and you know I live my life, you know, um, to God's approval, and I do, you know, take good care of myself and my children, and you know my lifestyle. But I mean, everybody has. Um, you know, freedom to do, you know, the things that they want to do. Okay. Yeah. I think, honestly, everybody's put on earth. You got to do the best you can to live and do what you think is right. Be a good person, pretty much? Absolutely. And, uh, and how, how do y'all know that y'all going to heaven? Because I've been good. <laughs> no. so, do you think you'll go to heaven? I'm pretty sure. I'm a real good guy, man. Easy guy to get along with. I do my deeds, man. Take care of my business. Okay. I think so, man. But how do you get to heaven? Being a good person. Being a good person? Yeah. Well, what's going to let you into heaven? Well, me being a good person. A good person? Do you know if you would go to heaven then? I'm absolutely sure that I'll go to heaven today. How would you know that, Zeke? I'm just a great guy, honest guy. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. I love my family. My family love me. We hold it down. This is I was in Texas. I'm going to heaven if I got zapped tonight. So there you go. Now you know. Everyone, so many people have this thought, you know, that I'm going to heaven because my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. The issue with that is, number one, how do you know? Because a lot of us do a good job of counting our good deeds, all right? I'm absolutely, line me up, sign me up. I did this today, I'll tell you all the stuff I've done good. How many of us do a real good job of counting our bad deeds? Yeah, we try and hide those. We're going to shuffle those off. Beyond that, do you really think you can count all the way from the time you're born to the time you die? Do you think you're going to be able to list all those things out? If not, you're just kind of hoping, aren't you? Well, not only that, but aren't there certain bad deeds that are like worse than others? And don't, that wouldn't it take more good things to outweigh? And so how do you know if the good things that you're doing outweigh some of these really bad stuff you did? You know, that's a terrible system to live under. I mean, when you really think about it, I have to do more good things. I, I'm not going to know I'm going to heaven until till right the time I die. And even then, I can't be for sure. That's a terrible way to live your life. Because you're never going to be good enough. You can't get there on your own. And that's why God said, people, you need some help. And that's why he sent Jesus to die in our place. Because we can't be good enough on our own. And that's why Ephesians 2 says this, It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, not from your good deeds, it's the gift of God. Not by works, so we can't boast. You know, it is by grace. It is by God's gift. Grace is, is getting something, heaven, that I don't deserve. Getting a relationship with God, I don't deserve that. But God's giving it to me anyway. It's not the great things that I do, so we can't start bragging about, well, I did, you know, 16 great things last week. How'd you do? 
it's understanding it's a gift from God. That's the grace that he offers. And it's a grace that, you know what? At some point, you've got to accept you just can't say, well, I grew up in the United States of America, and I haven't killed anyone recently, and so uh, I'm getting to heaven. You can't do that. That's not the way it works. The Bible says the way to heaven is accept the, the gift that God has given you. Accept the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, then it says that's how you get to heaven. But it's not just about heaven in the future when you die at some point. It's about a relationship with him right here, right now on this earth. And we don't want you to miss out on that. And there's some of you that have never made that choice to follow Christ. And, and we, uh, we have some people that would love to share with you from the Bible how you can begin that relationship with him today. So I just ask that you all stand up. And uh, if you want to talk to someone about beginning a relationship with Jesus, why don't you come meet me up front as we sing this song.